Okay, thank you, Dave. And uh, folks, you got the at the website. Click on the PayPal thing and please give Wool Spirit Radio a donation so he can replace this piece of equipment that keeps failing. Um, we're commercial free, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and I think it would behoove a lot of you to keep this information flowing. Many of people have heard this that I'm telling you before. <clears throat> um, I'll fast forward this because I don't want to go into all this detail. I started studying the patents, looking at the patents of these weapons. I found two, uh, some, some extreme significance of two of them. I am a chemist. <clears throat> um, I worked in the first 12 years of my, my career. I work as a polymer chemist. Um, and engineering, um, uh, rubber to metal bonding agents. Um, and I acquired quite a few U.S. patents for that, um, into waterborne rubber to metal bonding agents. Well, anyways, it's kind of a boring drab scope, but I, I, I got a, a purview of just how the way this world was hooked together. You, when you go into chemistry, you study nothing but hydrocarbons. You study that form of chemistry. Uh, that wasn't really for me because it negated anything that was natural. There was no natural supplementation uh, with these things that I was working for. But anyways, I'm going to fast forward this to studying the patents and seeing what they were doing. One of them, in fact, was the use of electromagnetism to power these weapons. They're all powered electromagnetically. But you know there's an energy here that has been totally forgotten about. You know what that is? It's called natural magnetism. The things that are here are embellished into something called magnetite or lodestone. Um, <clears throat> Pre-Cambian era, there was a, uh, microbes that in fact would eat rock and ore. And they would excrete this triangular shaped pellet. <clears throat> Isn't that interesting? It was almost a pyramid, pyramidal form. <clears throat> and that pellet immediately picked up because it was Fe three o four, it iron. It picked up the magnetic field of Earth, the biomagnetic field of Earth, then, which was ten times what it is today, or even a magnitude greater than ten. <clears throat> but it's a subtle energy. The magnetism of the Earth today is less than three, and we've got a great big huge electromagnetic grid girdling the magnetic field. <clears throat> so I started working with the energy at the prompting of Dr. John Maluski, a brilliant man, absolutely brilliant, down in New Mexico. And he was harvesting magnetite from granite formations at the base of the Sandia Mountains. Well, this was very ancient magnetite. It's called magnetite. Just, um, it looks like, uh, iron, but it's black sands. Black sands also has that same definition of magnetite. Well, this is what had picked up the magnetic field of Earth a long time ago. Well, I started working with, <clears throat> um, how to focus this, following in behind what Tesla was doing, studying some of what he was doing. And then I and then he said that if you focus any energy through a crystal, it accelerates it. And in fact, if you coil a wire on it, a right, and I coil a wire to the right spin, in other words, clockwise ascending, you in fact can accelerate and spin that energy. Well, you can't see natural magnetic energy. But it is the foci coming from this auric application of magnetite. The energy is there. 
Now, it may not be strong enough to stick on the wall or a piece of metal. It is subtle energy. And that subtle energy, when it's focused through a crystal, a quartz crystal, or any crystal for that matter, it in fact evolves from it, is focused or magnified, and in fact a right spin is put on that energy field as it erupts from the tip of the crystal in a very large elliptical, elliptical, not perfect straight uh, concentricity, that's electromagnetic. This is very, very sloppy uh, vortices. And that's exactly what they are. They're vortexes. Vortexes that come off the end of the crystal. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> well, I started making these things called the Tecumseh Peace Pendant. Yes, I've got lineage into the Shawnee, the Shawinian Indians of the High River Valley. Um, and it can be traced back to something that is within 10 miles of where the the encampment of the Shawnee used to be in southern Ohio, just south of Chillicothe, southeast of Chillicothe, Ohio. Um, looking at these things, I find that you can measure with an analog meter this magnetic vortex above you if you're wearing a pendant, or anywhere from there, uh, without grounding. As a matter of fact, I found out that this has properties of ground energy. You're putting a grounded energy field into the air in a very large spiral vortex. Well, this has so many properties to it <clears throat> that uh, I become excited and ask someone if they would make these for me. So <clears throat> my uh, my youngest daughter... Uh, who's all, also an artisan, uh, she's, she's made many, many, many of these pendants, the Tecumseh Peace Pendant, um, <clears throat> and uh, we sent them all over the world. We have, in all of the United States. The only problem I had with that particular design was that I did not want to use an epoxy or an epoxy ester because I find that that somewhat neuters its properties. In other words, it doesn't really give you the full yield of the magnetic energy that's in there when you lock it tightly into a lattice uh, chemical bond. So I used sodium silicate, which is water glass. Water glass can, in fact, be very uniquely crystallized using <clears throat> gold ion, yeah, real gold ion uh, from Dr. A. Truod and calcium ion. And it makes this loose, very tight structure of uh, magnetite, and it is cured. So you have essentially have you a ceramic composite material made out of Fe304. And <clears throat> these two crystals are placed in there, so they've got a ceramic bond to... The the base, which is made out of the magnetite mixed with the sodium silicate and catalyzed. So these things work very, very well, with exception that when you get them wet, it starts eroding the bonds. In other words, they're not chemi- they're not water resistant. So we've made quite a few changes to the recipe only to by putting some good polyurethane materials on top of them to get them to last longer. Well, we find out that uh, they did last longer, but then it seems that there has been so many people disgruntled because they literally fell apart. Um, we just didn't go back into it. Um, and we've more or less, it's ran its course, but I'm telling you all these components so you can make your own. Then I started researching Serpent Mound, <clears throat> made, constructed by the Adean Indians a long, long time ago in a former meteorite crater in southern Ohio. Well, this particular crater, in fact, um, has some very unusual properties, so they constructed this mound, fast forward again, 
I started looking at the archaeological digs that they had performed on that uh, particular site, including the ones done by Ohio State University, by Ohio State, and um, come to find that there were many piles of what they just labeled as stack rocks. Stack rocks. I got to looking at the stacking of the rocks, and I found out that there was always a lodestone, and there was a notation made on one of the pages by somebody who was actually at the site during one of these archaeological excavations. Uh, the lodestone was on the bottom, and it seemed like there was a crystalline or flint material on top, which also has crystalline properties. <clears throat> and then they found, you know, these are ancient Indians, okay, the mound builders, but were also recognized as savages. But they had found a way to put copper beads they found copper beads in these mounds which were strung together. Wait a minute. Savage, ancient Indians, where did they have the information to make not copper ore, not raw copper ore, but beads of copper? Something is amiss here in what we know about the people who were all over this North American continent before white man ever set foot on it. It's my supposition that these chains of beads were strung in a right spiraling motion to the top of that, and that is the same thing that I had designed. I called it an aperture because it does the same thing. It focuses the lodestone energy into the crystal, and in fact, it's accelerated. Well, Tesla didn't discover this until how many centuries later? <clears throat> but you see, it all accomplishes the same thing. It puts a right spiraling vortex, vortexian, into the entire area. But these are huge vortexes. They're low, subtle energy driven. And these vortexes, and again, supposition, I think that the Serpent Mound uh, is about fertility, not snakes. Why? Uh, I've looked at all kinds of aerial photographs of properties and objects on the ground. And so I used to fly a plane looking for farmer's dumps when I was in. I've done over a thousand environmental risk assessments for that, the phase one that that banks always ask for for you borrow money on, on any property. A phase one environmental insight assessment. That's what I've done professionally for what twenty five years before <clears throat> coming from a coatings and an anesthes background, <clears throat> but. Uh, what you see there is a sperm. That depiction of Serpent Mound in any aerial photograph is a spermacete. And if you look at what that snake is trying to engorge, it's not the earth. It's an ovum. It's an egg. Now, you tell me that... Um, that that wasn't a place of ceremony. But here's what they were doing. The tribes had their rain dancers and their medicine men. And they were taught from the day that they were born how to make certain sounds with their feet with moccasins on, how to, their, their feet would pummel the ground and put out extreme low-frequency waveform. Who to? Uh, You decide. You decide who they were communicating with. But then they were trained to make these guttural, good word, uh, Andy, thank you, guttural sounds with their stomach, which again were 
just above the frequency into the uh, very low frequency range. And then they had their gourds with seeds in them, which would create a high frequency sound, shish, shish. And they'd done this in unison to what they had been trained, and they would call for good harvest. They would call for good hunting. They would call for good fishing. They would call for all these natural things, and they always got them in abundance. And they survived for eons just with that. Now, you can't call that a technology, can you? That is a methodology. You have to be able to discern by reasoning. Technology is something that man has something to do with it. But if you have a method that it, that was born out of your ancestry somewhere, that's what I believe I have done. I have picked up on this trail again, um, and the, the properties of this natural magnetic energy, they're not amazing. They're natural. And that's what whomever you may think that this is, that's trying to take humanity down in every other life form, no matter who you think that is, it is electromagnetically driven. They're using electromagnetically powered weapons. You cannot look at something that is natural and say that's a good defense against them. No, it's not. It was here first. If you just stack rocks stack rocks and put a piece of copper coiled to the right now you have your own aperture just keep the lodestone or the magnetite on the bottom the crystal on top of that oh and you can get you can use water I got a design I call orgone in a bucket see I think orgone and natural magnetic energy are the exactly the same thing and the reason I say that is because Wilhelm Reich gave some clues because he said this energy will attract wild things. Okay, there's a clue right there. They had much abundance because it gave an area a presence that attracted wild things. Their hunting was always good. Go ahead. Can I chime in here for a second? You said that with uh, the Serpent Mound was in a... Um uh, an asteroid uh, crater impact. Would it be fair to be say right. there was uh, ferrous metal spread throughout the impact crater, making a bowl of ferrous metal that could be magnetized? <laughs> That's a very good supposition. I wish you could a prove parable, that. Parable, parabola, whatever exactly. you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. This is Andy, right? Yeah, Andy. And- we were on, the, on last night, yesterday, on a we're marathon together. Well, welcome, Andrew. Yeah, please chime in any time. You know, it it takes a certain skill set to be able to just to get on here and talk. Oh, Looking, I, I do I do seven live shows a week, so I'm quite. <laughs> <you know. laughs> I do a lot of radio. Well, anyways, no, I, I'm just trying to make reason something as reasonable uh, into what I was getting ready to say about the. Electromagnetic and folks, that is a very concentric, tight spin because it's man-made. It's electromagnetic and not natural magnetic, which has a right spiral. That is the spiral of the galaxy. That is the spiral of your own DNA helix. That is the spiral of all things that are natural. The things that are not natural takes a left spin. Well, I find out that when you put these two energies together, guess what? The ground energy, which is the the natural magnetic energy, always neuters the electromagnetic. I I think most people would find that accommodating to the point where you mean, well, okay, but when you ground electricity, what do you get? You get a short. It takes away that particular 
portion of the spectrum of uh, of electrons and it grounds it so it does in fact disconnect the electromagnetism and i find that in other ways too drinking naturally magnetized water whether it be distilled water whether it be spring water just make certain it's not tap water unless you filter that to take out the fluorine the, the fluorine based materials and the chlorine and now i understand that they're putting something like that keeps your pipe from rusting wait a minute i got copper pipes in the water system no but by law we're supposed to put an organo polyphosphate into it such as uh, um, Accutone, uh, Dr. Dean Lloyd has talked about many a times, and his battle out there to take that stuff out of the water. Well, uh, filter that stuff out. Okay, now you can still drink that. That's what I drink as well. But uh, when you naturally magnetize that, Dr. John Maluski studied this years ago, and he, in fact, all virtually proclaimed that after 72 hours of being in contact, now we're talking contact, not being in the water, but being in a bag uh, that is uh, in the sidewall or at the bottom uh, going through plastic, it will naturally magnetize that water to its full strength. In other words, after 72 hours, you really do not get an appreciable climb or rise. So it's saturated after 72 hours. Just by drinking that water, you can improve your own health. And all of this Morgellon stuff is electromagnetic. They got their own configuration there's a tube inside of a tube inside of a tube inside of a tube inside and it goes down I think seven times based on all the things that I could see or heard someone else say so we just given that to speculation but one of the tubes in fact is materials that it picks out of your own body and puts in there um, in this one central tube, which is nothing more than a wet battery. It's a wet battery. And it powers this entire, the, it powers the replicators, <clears throat> but it's again in supposition, when you drink natural magnetic, magnetic water, <clears throat> um, and it's got the, the right spin on it. As soon as the Morgellons fiber make contact with it, it shuts it down. Now, has anybody done any studies on, on this? I don't know. But I no longer have any symptoms of the Morgellon syndrome itself. And I've encouraged others to do the same. Um, I can't cite anybody else's study. I'm not going to do that. But there's so many things that attribute itself to the proliferation of the Morgellon, such as actinic light. Well, you look at the frequency of actinic light, 6 to 800 nanometers, <clears throat> that is uh, with outside the range of what you, in fact, have in the low hertz range of the natural magnetic energy. Um, think about that for a moment, because it is what I have faith in that is occurring. With Who else would have possibly thought that the natural biomagnetic field of Earth could be used to shut this proliferating fungal form down <clears throat> that is the natural magnetic energy. However you can utilize it, <clears throat> I believe, is something that you should look into, especially if you have 
problems um, if you think you've tested and you've got the more gallons? Uh, you, you got this syndrome. I mean, we're talking about a disease that is, that does not exist according to the CDC. It does not exist. You people are just nuts. You got parasitosis. But you see, natural magnetic energy can do anything because it is, in fact, God's energy. It came from this earth. Hey, and God, he God, created God, all these. Uh, Go ahead. Ask a question. Uh, are you familiar yeah. with the magnetic property properties of basalt? Of the what? Basalt. Not really. I haven't really dove into basalt. Uh, it's another. It's it's like magnetite. It's, it has a different crystal composition to it, and it's highly magnetic because it starts as a lava form and then rapidly cools. And a, a lot of the many stones in Egypt that weren't granite were basalt. And there's numerous stories where these basalt stones, you know, you know, flew around the, the campsites. Would it be fair to say if you had a, a naturally magnetic stone, whatever stone it would be, at, at, in your bedroom area, let's say one at the four corners of your post, or your bed, or if your bed was made out of it, would be an would be a great way to cancel the effects of, of magnetic based sicknesses like Morgellons? Yes, I agree with that. And I don't think there's any reservations towards trying that. Because natural magnetic energy cannot hurt you. It cannot cause right. a cancer. It's, it's right, it can't. I, I very much agree. Would it be fair to say that those natural, those natural things would need to be amplified at all? Let's say if you use a basic concept of a wet battery, like you had uh, a lemon, with some electrodes in it taped to the outside of the basalt stone. Well, I actually I found the <clears throat> that the phenols and the tannin phenols of most woods, live trees and woods will amplify this energy. Yeah. And it it magnanimously amplifies it. Um, if you put it, if you put magnetite at the base of the tree, and you've got any metal whatsoever uh, around that tree, such as a fence or whatever, um, just throw a piece of zinc, anything with zinc in it, or zinc plating, at the base of that tree, and that tree, in fact, will become fully energized, such as a tree in Columbus, Ohio, <clears throat> that I called her Mabel. She was uh, uh, she was a, uh, a beautiful maple tree, uh, one of the biggest ones in the entire neighborhood. And I found out that trees have intelligences because I told this tree one day before I called her Mabel. I said, "If you're going to throw the branches down there, throw them closer to the sidewalk." Because I got tired of going up and picking up all the branches. I am not. Exaggerating. Every branch from that time on was within an arm's length of the sidewalk. So, you know, uh, trees are in intelligent beings also. Um, they are a form of a being anyways. There's some places in this galaxy that, uh, they are, they are beings. Um, they are different than anything that we can imagine because we can't imagine unless they move. Uh, but they're not a creature. They're not anything that has any intelligence unless they move. Well, trees move a bunch. But um, she controlled the weather in that entire region. And I know for certain that it, in fact, caused a tornado to go right over top the house and hit a quarter of a mile away, and it just tore the crap out of that little that little town a half a mile away over by the airport. But you see, there's things that you can't explain, but if I didn't have this orgone generator or th that Mabel, that tree, uh, I, I guess I'm just exaggerating the point that you natural wood... Live wood 
amplifies this energy in a way that you can't think of it because we've always been taught that you got to have a metal to, 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 to conduct, correct? Conduct what? Well, we're not conducting anything that is electro or electron based. We're conducting something that is strictly subtle energy. That's all it is, is subtle energy from magnetite. And believe me, I've seen plants grow. I've used to put carbon in black um, and magnetite, just a very small amount of it, uh, in soil. I grew all kinds of things in a little greenhouse. Now, this part of Colossal I lived in was all a ghetto. <laughs> So, you know, gunshots were a familiar sound in my neighborhood. So, uh, but I still had a little greenhouse out there in that little, that little yard. And I found out many, many, many things. And I found out that magnetite in the soil, in fact, propagated actually taking orgone in a bucket. I was looking for properties, Andy. Uh, I hope you don't call me, mind you calling me uh, Andy. I- so anyways, <clears throat> took a bucket, and I had pole beans in the greenhouse growing, <clears throat> and I got them climbing up a string. Well, I mean, you know, they, they grew r- real nice and strong, <clears throat> but I didn't have magnetite in the soil or carbon black. But I just, I decided to try this experiment using this Oregon in the bucket design which was just a zinc galvanized bucket, get them at Lowe's, um, with about uh, a quarter of an inch of magnetite on the bottom, just a handful. Didn't need to be spaced or anything like that. Just put it in there. Then you got zinc with magnetite, and you put about a half inch water on top of it, and you throw in some crystals and some pennies. I suspected that Oregon also has a gaseous component. Well, I found out that I was correct about it because it is heavier than air. So when the moisture actually evaporates from the bucket, it comes over and forms along the ground. And I found out that I was exactly right about that because just outside of that space... That I had the orgone bucket. The other be- the control beans, in fact, did not grow. Just one night, those beans came up over five inches on the strings. Now there wasn't just one plant; there was three plants. And on the side over here, the control, which didn't have the bucket setting in front of them, only grew a half inch. But what I'm saying is there's certain things that we don't know about this that figuratively it tends to be affectionate and propagating to natural things. And there's so many things we don't know. Um, and you may be right about that place in uh, Serpent Mound, that meteor crater, because they do a lot of mining around that area. And, you know, even underneath of you, if you're in Ohio or if you're, I don't know, somewhere in Kansas, you drill down so deep, you'll always find this layer of black sands. That's also magnetite. called magnetite. That is also called magnetite. That has gold in it. And I know uh, uh, there's a former professor at Earlham College that actually We were doing a phase two on a filling station there in Richmond in the middle of the winter. And uh, he came over and he said, hey, can you give me a couple bags of that? Oh, you this black sand? He said, yeah. So he went back with his psych, one of his Jewish students, came back before we left and he said, okay, here's, and he had this little silver, little glass vial. And in the bottom of it, you can actually see gold flecks of material. That was the gold that came from that rather large bag of magnetite. So, again, magnetite always occurs before the gold. Um, uh, Gold, in fact, 
will find harbor in magnetite a lot of times, so you can't find it. But anyways, again, it's properties that um, we just don't look for. But it's the magnetism of the of the lodestone, the magnetism of the magnetite that's got me on this uh, venture that I'm on right now. I can, can see. I, can so I chime in here for a second, real quick. I had another question I want to ask you. Um, are, are you familiar with a more modern organite, where they take a crystal with two pieces of magnetite? so that they attach to the crystal, and then they wrap it in a copper wire. Are you familiar with all of that? And then they put these inside a resin with all the points pointing out, and they make a dish. So imagine a circle of copper crystals, of crystals with magnetite, magnetite on them, wrapped in copper, and then you have 30 of or 36 of those, each representing one, one degree of the direction. Have you, have you heard anything like that? Yes, I have. Uh, Dwayne Gardner, uh, who is Organite Austin, taught me a lot about that. And he's also taken some of the pendant materials and uh, that I sent him and being able to modify one of his existing design. Uh, Dwayne Gardner in uh, Austin, Texas, is, uh, is a young man who is absolutely at the same level Tesla was at but Tesla was electromagnetism. Dwayne Gardner is strictly natural magnetism and orgon and organite. Yes. I learned a lot from this young man. I had him on my show, uh, a couple of years back. Um, you know, I just, actually, I, I listened to that. I listened to that actually. Okay. I, I, know, I know exactly what you're talking about. He's got just stones. You just put stones that can change the energy of the whole area. Yeah, just I, by I, putting kinds of stones around. And it's I, I'm a I'm a rock hound, so I find magnetite sand and magnetite chunks all the time. In the room I'm in, there's probably well over 700 pieces of crystal. I guess my main question to you is: when you have two magnetite pieces and you attach it to the crystal, so the magnetic energy is holding the two the two magnetite to the crystal, that crystalline matrix inside there is under the magnetic influence. Is it true that's creating like a breathing motion because the magnetite's constantly using its its energy to make its spiritual, spherical, omnidirectional magnetic influence? And it's creating a, a stress on the crystalline matrix of the crystal that's in between the two pieces of uh, magnetite. Yes, it's bonded the way that uh, Sarah puts the crystals in. She puts the crystals in when it's in a wet matrix and sh- shakes them and there's twin crystals in there. One is right spiraling, uh, and the other one is left spiraling or right spiraling going down. So you've got two fields there which covers the bottom half and the upper half of the human body if you're wearing it. But that particular stress uh, does cause piezoelectric to form. But that particular formation isn't as important as the auric energy coming from the magnetite itself. And the types of resins that you use uh, or select for that particular application of compressing the crystal is extremely important because I found that the auric energy is neutered somewhat if you use epoxy esters and those types of materials with a peroxide cure or a diamine cure that is used in standard, uh, well, you know, they make these little uh, triangles and they throw them off. They throw them all um, across the uh, across the great <laughs> United States in front of cell tires and stuff, well, yeah, those, in fact, are constructed with pieces of material that um, are cast in either a urethane or it's cast in an epoxy. Mostly it's a Bondo type of epoxy reaction that, um, that uh, or a styrene, a styrene type uh, analog of that same material. Now, there's one difference... I will not use aluminum either in or on 
that pendant or anywhere that I build a generator, I will not use aluminum because Wilhelm Reich did not like the use of aluminum. And, in fact, he was purported to have once said, don't use my cloud buster and put aluminum in it. Somewhere along the line, he used that comment and somebody brought it forward. Well, um, that's why I don't use, because he said aluminum did not have a true resonant ring to it. It didn't have a vocal ring to it that could be assigned a specific frequency. It was more of a clutter, a clatch. It didn't have a true ring to it. I, so I, I don't see what, I what from aluminum because of that. I guess I have another question. I make organite. I just use wax to make my pieces, um, regular candle wax, and then and I can I can build pretty big pieces. In one instance, uh, uh, I had a, me and a friend of mine built a really big piece. We had a five gallon bucket and filled it up with crystals and uh, copper BBs and pieces of magnetite sand. I mean, there there was probably thousand dollars worth of crystals and rocks and, and magnetite in there. And, uh, we ended up using a, 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 a resin that you can buy that's, you know, a lot less chemically bound. And we put that inside a, um, uh, how do I put this? A, a freezer cooler for, um, a sushi bar. And we've noticed that all of the food is fresher. And they bring it in and out of the freezer now. So like when during the day there's this big massive organ, a piece of organite, so the, it's a centerpiece there. What is your opinion of something that's big like that, that has all those features that's in the round places where people come and go to eat, and then in the off hours it's uh, in the area where the food is stored? Well, I think you got a, a very good sub- – pardon the dog there. You got a good uh, thing going there. I know that once you enter into this natural magnetic energy vortexian field – it does relieve a lot of the strain and stress because it does deflect electromagnetism. It does deflect microwave. It does deflect many of things, but it, um, it also aids in the, uh, propagation of good microbes, um, uh, and things of that nature. But, um, yeah, well, <laughs> What can I say? Did I lose you, Doctor? Did you hit mute? Live energy as such. Uh, I try to mute the dog barking, so pardon me. Okay. I'm on again now? Okay. Yeah, you're back. Just plant some live trees around that particular area where you're talking about. <clears throat> or set five-gallon buck inside that or inside that area. I think once again you will notice some more propagation of subtle energy. Because that's all this is, is subtle energy. A Fang Shave person came in after we put it in there a year after, and she was so impressed with it, she went and bought several dozen bonsai trees to put out through the the restaurant. And that, it just like you said, we noticed a massive change in the mood of the place. Once once those bonsai plants began to, to bond with that piece of, you know, organite. Yes, it's just like, it's just like, it, it, it's a fix to it. It's, it's like it, it just embellishes that energy and it's like it's nourishment. And I can tell you, uh, know a lot about chemicals, but I've never seen anything respond so, uh, so appreciably when you put this subtle energy in the presence of this. And, it, it, and folks, we're not talking about something that you cannot obtain. All you gotta do is get a piece of magnetite and hook some crystals to it. Now don't make it look like something that's going to explode or something. But it, it's so simple. You can use flint. Any kind of crystal. In fact, I'd love to see a study of somebody doing that someday that was, enables you to, to, um, have even higher yields of the vortexing energy. Uh, uh, in other words, finding something that focuses this energy, and that's all the crystal does is focuses the, the energy. 
even small amounts, it doesn't necessarily amplify it. Wood amplifies the energy, and it does. It amplifies energy to a point where you've got these massive vortices that you cannot see, but I can assure you all the birds, we actually uh, took a picture of a yellowtail hawk coming to our backyard and sitting on the fence. And my late wife took a picture of it, and she said, that is absolutely amazing, Michael. And at that day, she knew exactly what I was trying to describe. The geese that went over to the elementary school would fly and turn and go north because I knew these uh, this vortexing energy was creating uh, pathways uh, or corridors directly north towards the magnetic pole. And they would turn. She was out there at 4.30 on one morning in 2009, I think. And she said, I've seen the most amazing thing. She said, I've seen these, these geese that she heard coming up from the west and came right over top of the house and went due north, right where I told her they would go, right towards that great big tree down there. But you see, they form corridors. We don't know what these are, but wild things are attracted to this energy. That's why I know orgone and organite have the same exact properties. It's just that I'm amplifying and focusing this energy in a different way. That That's all I'm doing. And really, I didn't discover that. The Adenian yeah, Indians did. What do you think uh, pyramidal structures or geometric, geometric structures affect the orgone? I think that the pyramidal structures, uh, in fact, are very unique. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, the design of the pellet of undisturbed uh, magnetite is that of a pyramid, a very small pyramidal structure, and it's got uh, five sides to it, including the bottom. And this is how these things are like excreted by this microbe a long time ago. And that's why this energy is it's a repository of the natural biomagnetic field of Earth way back when, when it was so much more vibrant and stronger than it is today. Because we've got this thing girdled with electromagnetism. And it's just like, I mean... Uh, no wonder everything is dying. <clears throat> You've taken away the subtle energy that in fact creates the, the plane, the longitudinal plane of the scalar fields that we think we understand. I really don't think we have a clue because we've not been taught that. We've been taught everything based on electromagnetism. Um, <clears throat> well, when I see the properties of this as a scientist, in fact, being so magnanimous and being able to deflect that because they're using that as a weapon, that's my point. I, I had a tumor <clears throat> that came out on my right hand. <clears throat> uh, this has been in years ago, 2000. Hey, hey doctor, it's, it's uh, time uh, for a break over here. Uh, Dave's got a break to dub. Why don't we save that story to the other side of the break and we can refill our coffins. Okay, great idea. Thank you, Andy. You're listening to Wolf Spirit Radio. Now, folks, we'll be back just after our break. Okay, Dave, uh, am I live? Am I on broadcast? Yes, sir, you are, and uh, Andrew stepped away to fill up his coffee cup. Okay, well, mine's running through right now. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, uh, just a special request. Uh, Merlot was a very love wolf that Dave Corso got a couple of years ago. And um, I, I know just by talking, and Dave's going through grieving right now because he knows he's going to lose that wolf. I think, uh, Dave, didn't you say he was the alpha? I think he, you said he was the alpha, but... Okay. And a half years he's been here. His 
been the happiest two and a half years of his life. He had a home and he yes. had humans that absolutely loved him. He had a whole pack of canines that absolutely loved him. And you see, folks, this is the love that is shared between man and his canine. Um, and that's something you really can't describe without um, those of you that have loved your pets. If you just tell them, just quietly, just once, you'll see them at the Rainbow Bridge someday. They'll know what you're talking about. I did that with a, a a black cat I fell in love with. Mr. Me. <clears throat> that was uh, my late wife's daughter's cat. And we just, we didn't hit it off right, uh, right at, 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 uh, at the beginning. But <clears throat> uh, I played a song on my 12 string I called Kino Uta. And he was Siamese, and he just fell in love with that song, and he would come in and lay on my feet as I played that song. And I told him he got cancer in his mouth by eating that 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 stuff that they put components in it from China. <clears throat> I'm reticent to say exactly what it was, but it was in an orange bag, and it was really supposed to be good stuff. And he got poisoned by that, and he got cancer of the mouth. He couldn't eat it anymore. They decided to go ahead, uh, the daughter decided to go ahead and put him down because he was suffering. But two days before they, they took him to the vet, and I went with him. Um, I told Mr. Me, I said, I will see you at the Rainbow Bridge someday. That seemed to provide comfort to him. And I, I remember looking back at him and he looked at me and was, we were walking out and he was gone. But you know, I have faith in what I told that little cat. And I know Dave has faith that he will too see Merlo someday at the Rainbow Bridge. Oh. There's an appropriate sound. There's an appropriate sound, exactly. There, there's a salute if I ever heard one. <laughs> well, anyways, Very much agree. That's, that's Annie. That's uh, my uh, my friend's pet, and uh, she said, "Well, when you when you and when you come here, you have to accept me, and you have to accept Annie." So I do. Uh, just a beautiful uh, mix of. Uh, Dotson and uh, I think Black Lab, but anyway, she's a beautiful dog. Uh, she has a fit when I start hugging on my friend. <laughs> Jealousy? My, I never seen anything like that. But anyways, it's appropriate, and I go along with it. But she loves me too. But you know, there's there's a tribute that needs to be made to Merlot. I mean, maybe the first time you ever heard this animal's name. But Dave Corso told me one time, he said, you wouldn't believe how these animals communicate with each other. Dave had the gift of being able to understand exactly what they said as soon as they walked into the presence of one another. Um, and I think that we, we so, we get so entrenched in this matrix this electromagnetic matrix that we forget that there are other beings here too. Um, and those are our loving, our love pets. <clears throat> but, you know, we're, uh, we're so bound up in all these things. We just don't really take the time, take the time to tell your beloved animal, your beloved friend, and some of them are the only friends that these people have in this world, that they are love. But just tell them, someday you will see them again at the Rainbow Bridge. They will understand what you're saying. You see, but we don't think that they have intelligence to comprehend the spoken word. Give me a break. <laughs> they, they understand exactly what we're saying and many times can predict what we're walking into. But we can't. But they do. So you see, they've got gifts beyond what we understand 
the realm of. So, anyways, Andy, I'll go back to this thing about natural magnetic energy just for a moment. I had this tumor come up on my hand, my right hand, right on the top of it. I turned one of my pendants, actually it was a disruptor, because we make the pendants and the disruptors, um, and I turned it upside down and took a cloth and just bandaged it and let, left it on there overnight. Just overnight. I took it off the very next morning. That entire appendage, whatever it was, was completely gone. Completely gone. That was a you tell me what that. Up? I don't know what it was, but but that was rampant at the time. I know we has been sprayed because um, uh, I don't have to go into that diatribe about. Well, I wonder if they are putting this. Uh, these little nodules in these fibers? Yes, they do. These fibers are designed to break into zillions of char shards, and we inhale them. And they can right. give you a sinus infection like you ain't going, like I got here about <clears throat> three months ago, two months ago. And I mean to tell you, it infested my whole upper mastoid sinus cavity. Right. And <clears throat> the only thing that got rid of that was oregano. Oregano and silver colloid, uh, nasal spray. But anyways, back to the point. This has properties like you wouldn't believe. Uh, my friend's daughter, uh, has sprained her foot real bad. And I just happened to have one of these pendants in my pocket. It was one that Sarah had put, uh, rubber. She taken a, a, uh, glue gun and there's a real rubbery type material that she put on the back of it. Well, that thing lasted forever, you know. Should have thought of that a long time ago. But I didn't want to interrupt um, the flow of natural, subtle energy from this material. Well, she had sprained her foot real bad, and she put one of those boots on, you know, one of those boots that immobilizes it. Now, she didn't break it, but she sprained it real bad. Now, this was the first... Yeah, it was like an air air thing. Yeah, you can pump it up, you know. <clears throat> well, um, you, know, you get this picture. This was the first time I had ever met this young lady. And <clears throat> oh, and she come in with this boot on, and I knew what had happened. Uh, my friend told me what happened to her. She sprained it real bad. Well, and she took that boot off, and, man, that thing was redder. That thing was red. You could just, and it was hot. And she looked at me and and I said, well, amongst many other things, and I said, I pulled that pendant out of my pocket and I said, look, tape this to the top of your foot and leave it on all night and let me know what you found the next morning. I mean, she was not taking drugs or anything like that. That's what I was trying to avoid her doing. So she did. Well, before I could get back home up around Dayton, um, I got the call from my friend, her mother, and she said that the pain went away, the swelling went away, and the, and the burning went away. Mm -hmm. And she'd only had it on there for three hours. She didn't leave it all night. But you see, there's things that we cannot explain. Dr. Gwen Scott down in New Mexico, she had reported the same things on the middle of her back. She had something on her back. And she would turn the pendant around and tape it to her back in that one spot. And I, she never did say exactly what that spot was. But every time she got around one of these massive, ugly Gwen Towers that they had constructed in the, not a half mile, a mile away from her, from where she lives, uh, this thing just ached and pained all the time. Well, she turned the pendant around and put it on that spot and wore it backwards, essentially, just overnight, and the pain would completely be gone from that area. So, and she's done a lot of Morgellons research through the years. 
more so than I think anybody else. And, of course, she was with Clifford Carnicom before he established the Morgellons Institute, I think it was called. So there's a, a lot of people that have put in pieces of this puzzle, but, again, I didn't discover anything. I'm just utilizing something that someone else discovered a long, long time ago and just trying to apply it to today because it is subtle energy. Doctor, are you familiar with Reiki? Say again, what? Are you familiar with the energy healing system called Reiki? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm a Reiki master, and uh, I use uh, crystals with the, the magnetite and the, and the right ascending uh, copper twist. I use that in my Reiki, and I apply it to acupressure points. I've studied acupressure and acupuncture for years now. And I've had absolutely amazing results, very similar to yours, and in some scenarios where complete tumors have evaporated within three to four weeks of people uh, simply using medical tape to keep the crystals affixed to a spot on their foot or a spot over their kneecap or on an elbow or the back of the neck when they're sleeping. Amazing oh, results. People with, with migraines, disappeared migraines, temporary when they did uh, TMJ, uh, gone within four days. And then the jaw actually repairs itself and stops clicking. But you, you are you are singing such a beautiful song, Andrew. Such a beautiful song because it fits in to the other miracles that I think we are yet to discover just using what God put here to begin with. And to be able to deflect the electromagnetic influence, to deflect the microwaves, um, you know, the, these, uh, I've, you heard me, my dissertation a little bit on the Gwen Towers, the ground wave energy network, the Gwen Towers, which have got nothing to do with anything except it is the psychotronic warfare that Brzezinski, Zygmunt Brzezinski spoke about and bragged about in his book. In his money I've book. Act, I've, I've actually idea. developed my own counter to, to weapons like that. And, uh, it can go over your bed like a, like a mosquito net or it can be woven into a blanket that you wear over. And it's just a series of copper wires with crystals, uh, basically in a radiative pattern and it's in a thicker type blanket and, um, it kind of stretches out and like, you know, if you, so if you bumble your blanket up, it'll, it'll stretch itself back out so the coils won't go over each other. Um, right. it's really simple. It's the same concept as the copper beads. Um, and the key was to use an all-natural fiber that wasn't uh, that had enough tensile strength that wouldn't break, and we ended up finding that twine worked the best. Twine, Cis- uh, cotton, cotton twine, cotton twine, yeah. Yep, with knots well, in it for extra strength, and it was a handmade you- woven blanket. And let me tell you something: everybody that's ever worn that blanket, uh, we made a poncho version of it too, and uh, our friends that are next to towers. Let me tell you, amazing. It's like having psychic armor on. I mean, there's like 60 crystals in it and like, you know, 25 feet of copper cord, copper wire stretched within it. So it's it's not, and magnetite in it too, so. Well, I found out that charcoal mixed with just a very small amount of magnetite um, in a matrix of psyllium husk, which psyllium husk in if you put um, a natural vegetable glycerin in it, it softens it to the point where it it has um, stress strain physical properties which are very unique. And one of those properties is um, it will dampen, it will super dampen uh, any acoustical wave. Now the Gwen Towers have a rise up to about ten. And then going on through 15, it produces an acoustical waveform. And that's the thing that comes out of the Gwen Towers, which joggles your own alpha wave. It's acoustical. And then it joggles your alpha waves, and then they embed. It's called an affirmation using modulated frequency of microwaves. They embed something, and you don't know that just happened. You think it's your own thought. That's what's scary about this stuff. But if you have any type of garment made out of psyllium husk with carbon black and a very small amount of magnetite, it will super dampen 
that acoustical portion which joggles your alpha wave. And I know a, a, uh, a gentleman in Southern California, Rick Dubov, who actually made a hat and wears, I've got a picture of him wearing the hat. <clears throat> and uh, another person, uh, <clears throat> a very good friend in uh, Idaho, she too made one of these hats out of the same simple recipe using silly musk, uh, a, a good natural uh, cellulosic material, um, <clears throat> vegetable glycerin, <clears throat> um, a little bit of uh, carbon black, <clears throat> and and uh, and a, a small amount of magnetite. That will deflect, and the carbon will deflect the microwave just as the uh, a, a carbonaceous coating on an aircraft will deflect microwave radar. So it does the same thing in here, but you got this, this rubberized consistency, the polymeric consistency also super dampens the acoustical portion. So if you have a hat made out of this, it's going to completely dampen that. Um, but see, these are simple things. Well, silly mouse, ladies and gentlemen, is the same thing as in Metamucil. The stuff that you take to, I guess is a mild laxative, but uh, you, <laughs> just silly musk. Um, and um, you dissolve that in water, good water, and you make this in a, in a fashion. Um, and I've got a recipe that's on my website, but I understand my website is temporarily down. But it, um, it is so simple to make this two-component material. And then you bond it between two sheaves of fabric. Uh, take a large woven fabric or a cotton fabric, any fabric that you choose. As a matter of fact, I've even got a bonding agent for it because I used to spend a lot of time making rubber to fabric bonding agents. Believe it or not, it's pure maple syrup diluted down just a little bit and you put cream of tartar in it because that's potassium acid and it's an adduct of potassium acid. You put cream and tartar in there, which actually slightly cross-links it, but you just let it air dry. Paint this with just a very, uh, just a very light coat of, of, uh, maple syrup, pure maple syrup. Don't have any high fructose corn syrup in it or cane sugar. Just ma- pure organic maple syrup. <clears throat> and with a little bit of, um, of, uh, cream and tartar in it. And I mean just a very small amount. Um, like if you've got a, a cup of of the material, you put in less, and you don't need that much to coat the fabric with, but you put in less than um, an eighth of a teaspoon of cream of tartar because it's extremely catalytic. <clears throat> the acid is very catalytic on the on, on the, uh, um, on the, uh, the the long phenols of the uh, the maple syrup, but you just put that on there and let it air dry. Uh, you can bake it on if you want to, if you want to put it in the oven for just uh, uh, ten seconds or something, and let it let it let it after it dries out and speed up your production of the article a little bit. But now you take the silly mouse composition, the two part, and it doesn't need to be two part. I just found out a way of making sure that it foams up a little bit. And you put that composition and you squish it down. And you put the piece of fabric on top of it, also coated with a bonding agent. And you squish it down with books. And you can squish this into, uh, an eighth of an inch film. And you can, you can cut that. You can, uh, form that. You can do anything you want to with it. You can make a hat out of it. You can make a ball hat out of it. You can make a cowboy hat out of it. It just depends on where your skill levels are at. But that will completely deflect everything from the from the upper temporal lobes of your brain, which they target with these Gwen Towers, to change your mind. Um, and the Lowry patents, it's called the Lowry patents, describe this phenomena exactly. Because they knew exactly what they were doing when they put these towers up. It wasn't a remnant of the Cold War, Andy. Uh, these things have been constructed up to 2009 very, very close to me. And most of them are set right in proximity, very close proximity, if not right on top of elementary and secondary school systems. 
they all set around nursing homes and what is the plan here when they turn these things on when they turn these things on you better have something to deflect this waveform because you just don't really know that it's hitting you because it has we're in a flood we're a wash in a vast sea right now of these waveform including the plasmas that Clifford Carnicom talks about we are a wash in this and so it doesn't take much, in fact, to be able to figure out if you've got something to protect yourself with these components. And by the way, magna, magnetite is the perfect deflectant of all these. It will even deflect gamma radiation. But see, the exactly. DOE, go ahead. I, I've been, uh, I was telling you about other ways to deflect it as you brought something up uh a friend of mine and I were brainstorming to come up with different concepts that could help people. And one of the concepts was to replace the shingling that you have in your house with magnetite dust and uh, copper copper flakes embedded in it. So you make shingles that are essentially orgone shingles to help deflect the magnetic frequency of the towers that are around you. And we'd also take it to another level where we were going to put uh, embed crystals, copper wrap crystals inside bricks and then use magnetite mortar, based mortar to bond all the bricks together for building. So that's a lot of magnetite. Put a little carbon black in it to extend the magnetite because it does work with the carbon crystallite. It does work with the carbon crystallite. Of course, you got carbon black. Okay, well, you know, rubber is the same way it it cures through sulfidic bonding and forms a very large crystalline mat called a, a cross link rubber section. So those are great ideas. Those are really magnificent ideas. But, uh, the only place is, the only problem is where do we possibly get started with something like that? I think that concept of using the shingles is, um, <clears throat> Well, I've got to go to something else I experimented with. Did you know that magnetite with tourmaline crystals in it will conduct it at the same thing as a photovoltaic battery cell generator? It will I was aware of that. Yeah, I was aware of that. With tourmaline, just tourmaline yep. crystals. And there's a Russian scientist that discovered that. So you see, we find that there's all these things. If we're going to use electricity... Well, most of our things are powered by electricity. We can still do that just by modifying the mixture of those things with magnetite. We don't know anything about natural magnetic energy or magnetite or lodestone, but we know enough about it that if we modify it just ever so slightly, magnetite with trimaline crystals, in fact, will do what? It will generate electricity from solar Okay. Yep. See, we, 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 we're on to something here. And not only is it a solar, you know, system, it retains heat or reflects heat. You know, it has all the properties of the metal. Uh, think about it, um, you know, you have your, and it's a, a great, great concept and it can be made into the same kind of mats that could be laid down for shingles or squares or rolls that unrolled. Um, yes. I mean, it could have flexibility to it. It has yes. long term durability in it. And I'll tell you the fiber I like to see, and that comes from the milkweed pod. The fibers from milkweed, in fact, have a natural uh, uh, non-moldability. Uh, it's a natural fungistat. Uh, and any garments woven from milkweed, and there was a company in Nebraska that years ago had done, they had planted acres, acres of milkweed and found that this fiber, and I wanted to so intensely get a piece of this fiber to do some more research on it. Uh, my background includes fibers. So, um, you know, I mean, that's been my passion all the, to, for, to develop things that are truthfully sustainable, but genocide is not part of it. In other words, we're not going to kill off a bunch of people just to make this sustainability scheme work. No, it's whomever you are, however many you are, 
This is something that won't kill you in the process if you just eat it or use it or something of that 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 analog, you know, is something that is truthfully sustainable. And that's what I I had the a company in Lewisburg, Ohio called Sustainable Technologies Corporation. That was the name of my company. Um, that's when I used to flirt around with a bunch of guys at Federal EPA and the Futures Group in Washington, D.C. years ago. Back in 95, 96, you know. Well, they too, in fact, had endeavored to listen to me and see the macrex, a macro polymeric bound matrix that was made out of 65% recycled paper fiber at a minimum. 65% paper fiber. But this particular wood, pseudo wood is what I called it, it would not burn. I've been able to incorporate something of the calcium variety into that so it would not burn and it had no VOC, it had no plasticizers, it had no gaseous composition that in fact would retard it and no halogens. It had nothing like that in it. But I did develop a resin system that, in fact, would be cross-linked by microwave. Yeah, I, I, I invented that. But I was not going to patent it because I found out who was at the doorstep of the patent office. And they were nothing but corporations. And they're going to steal anything significant that you, in fact, put in the U.S. patent office. And it's ran by a bunch of snakes and thieves. They're also called lawyers. I got another question. Are you familiar with hempcrete and how that works? It's uh, making its way to, to from Europe to Canada now. And we also considered uh, applying uh, magnetite and crystal chunks and copper BBs to making hempcrete uh, structures. Because you can oh. control the consistency of the hempcrete spray. And that's solid hemp compressed, uh, sprayed into a sprayed, and it's a natural. Are you familiar at all with hempcrete? Hemp Creek? Yeah, Hemp Creek. It's basically ground up hemp uh, from the hemp plant with uh, a, an emulsor on it, and it makes it as hard as concrete. No, I was not familiar with that, Andrew. No, I'd yes. <clears throat> like to know more about that. But uh, making a structure out of something like that, um, <clears throat> I could see how that would have the potential of being sustainable all the way around. Another thing I had come up with is after we had came up with the idea for the shingles was to make a pool blanket out of the same shingle material and that it could magnetize the surface of water as well as act as a natural orgone generator on the surface of the water to prevent water cleanliness for water cleaning plants. Yes. Yes, plus there's a certain energy that we don't understand that's coming from naturally magnetized water. Uh, look at the times and the things that you heard about uh, from places on this earth, such as natural magnetic springs. Yep. And I think that the place in uh, France where the nuns, uh, I can't think of the name of it right now. I got the CRS disease to say. But uh, the, where, where they had the vision and... Uh, well, the name escapes me. But anyways, that was also the water that well sprung from the, from the grotto, in fact, was natural magnetic water. Uh, <clears throat> I've also done a research on waters, and I find that if you take <clears throat> colloidal silver, good quality colloidal silver, <clears throat> and naturally magnetize that just by sitting in close proximity to magnetite for 72 hours. Someone said a long time ago, well, that's the same thing that they used to do with holy water. Oh, really? Oh, you mean you sprinkle holy water on vampires and it just like melts them or something? Yeah, same stuff. But think about that. Silver colloid and naturally magnetic water or magnetized silver colloid water. Um, I can certainly see that being dramatic. So I got the silver colloid one time and I magnetized it. And let me tell you, 
That is one powerful silver colloid. <laughs> Just the water by itself is powerful. But see, it's doing things that I don't know that it's occurring, but none of them are consequential. None of them, in fact, are side effects. They are natural magnetic uh, auras being developed in your own body. And I think that has a lot to do with the flow of life. Uh, uh, the flow of life, uh, even uh, into nursing mothers, if they're drinking naturally magnetized water, I, I, I do have faith in the baby will be uh, so much more healthier than any other thing that you could possibly do to it uh, or feed it. Just nursing. Because all the mineral compositions are naturally magnetized. All the oils, the lipids are naturally magnetized. But again, we don't know this um, arena because we've never been taught anything about it. It's almost like well, that's the garbage that the Indians used to use, you know. Never that's been that. allowed to be a science. Exactly. It is I got the a question. little basis of science. I got a question about other minerals. But what about palladium or platinum? Well, there's some very unique things that can be done with platinum in particular. Very, and just having an airstream pass through platinum... Um, I'll tell you something that I'm even more intrigued with, and that's the interpolation of what rhodium does. And iridium, too. Rhodium, yeah. Yeah. Rhodium, in fact, has a, a place that we yet are unable to really verify as chemist or anyplace else because... We don't understand the natural world. If we were to understand the natural world a little bit uh, more succinctly, I think we would be amazed at what nature can do and will do without any chemical compositions put on it or in it or otherwise. It's uh, it's something that it, it just uh, endears my heart that we're having this discussion was someone else who is, in fact, gifted in the knowledge of natural things. Are we talking about, oh, there's a violation of all natural laws and this and that? Well, of course, that's their intent. <clears throat> when I wrote The Methodic Demise of Natural Earth, that was my intent to point out, look, people, they're killing not just us, but they're killing everything. They are murdering everything. Uh, at one time, I was almost ready to cross the line thinking, this has got to be some kind of alien species uh, that are doing this, and I'm not certain that they're not. I'm not really certain that they're not a, a, a certain alien species that want this planet just for themselves once they eradicate those who were made in God's image. That's why we've got this magnanimous authority that we allow them to take away from us every single day and just knowing that you have uh, a power that comes from your soul that cannot be taken away it, it cannot be ensnared it can't be anything but a, a god-given gift and uh, we all have these god-given gifts but we rarely recognize them Everything that I've ever done, I've given glory to God and and, grati- and, and, and gratitude of highest order. It's a personal thing. Once you know he is in your heart, folks, that's all you need to do. You, you don't need to mail in some kind of pamphlet. You don't need to do that. You don't need to stand in line to have a pair. Just as long as you know that we are made in his image and only we are. However, God intended that to read in the Bible. We are made in his image. And therefore, his son came to this earth in that, in the image of man. He was a man. But guess what? He loved sin. No. He loved sinners, but he despised what we do. He did not hate us. 
That was called the grace of God. But you see, unless we know this, yeah, we'll just keep going down track just thinking one of these days something will hit us. Yeah, well, you're not going to like it when it does. It's probably going to be cause cancer. If I can tell you anything, ladies and gentlemen, please take a look at natural magnetic energies because this you can't really develop a scientific name for that because that's what it is. It's subtle, S-U-B-T-L-E, energy. It's subtle energy. It's not something that comes on like an amazing x-ray or something like that, but you'd be amazed at how this deflects deflects these waves, these weapons that they've got aimed at us, and they're taking us out every single day. Um, please continue, Andrew. Um, I was going to ask you about iridium next. Um, the platinum group families have some amazing electrical properties. You know, I was I was considering, you know, once, once we manage to get ourselves free here, I mean, you know, thinking out of the box, these natural, subtle energies are going to be affected by the natural elements of the planet. And each each natural element is going to have something that relates to a scale in that subtle energy. And we just haven't had scientists and studiers to create that scale, to create that frame of reference so that technology can be built around that subtle energy concept. And some of the ideas I've come up and you come up and the many others that come up begin to scratch at that surface and some go below the surface. I was going to say this next level we have here is almost in one way alchemical because that's the, the nature we're going to fall back on to, to try to bring these subtle energy fields out into normal science because subtle energy affects the human body, subtle energy affects our animals, our food, it affects every angle of our environment that has a planetary consciousness behind it. Oh, well said. It's exactly um, my witness as well. Um, again, I'm coming from a, a field of study that I've participated in to the um, uh, writing, being the author and the inventor of U.S. patents. Oh, by the way, my first U.S. patent, and you can check this out, was reclaiming cast-cured polyurethane elastomers by me. Um, uh, that was in 1976. So I've been at this a long time. See, reclaiming was the word that they used before the word recycle came along. <laughs> So it was reclaiming cast cured polyurethane elastomers. That's my first U.S. patent. And then I've have a bridge of many more. And actually I got uh, let go of my position at that company because I refused to allow this guy who just showed up uh, from the competition. He was hired in from the competitor, <clears throat> the only competitor we have in the in the world. Um, and he was hired in, and I didn't like this at all, but he demanded that his name go on my patents, and I, I in fact, uh, uh, locked horns with him. And I never did agree that he could sign any of my patents, because he had absolutely nothing to do with them. Well, his patented materials, though, turned out to be the most toxic, 